Now, I had a message prepared this week, but I believe tonight God's taken me a different direction, and we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 37. Verse number one says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And for a few short minutes tonight, if you'd help me tonight, I'd like to preach a message entitled, Dead, but not done. Dead, but not done done. Why don't we put our Bibles down right now, begin to lift up the name of Jesus. Oh, we thank you and we praise you tonight. We thank you for the move that you've already had occurred in this place. But God, we know you have so much more for us. God, I pray that you would anoint my lips of clay tonight to preach exactly the word that you have given me. Nothing more and nothing less. And God, anoint the ear to hear and let this fall on good ground tonight. And let us leave this place changed and renewed and revived in you. Speak to us tonight, Jesus. And we'll give you all praise, all glory, and all honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight I open with a passage from the prophet Ezekiel that he wrote in his book. And he speaks of this encounter with God that he had. And he said that the hand of the Lord was upon him. And God, he began to take him out upon this valley. And all throughout this valley, Ezekiel could see bones everywhere. Thousands of bones. And he says that they were all over this open valley, but he says they were very dry. So we can assume from this description that Ezekiel is seeing bones that have been there for a very long time. These were not fresh bones, but they were bones of people who were dead for very long. But God, he begins to speak to Ezekiel and he tells him, son of man, can these bones live? Now, Ezekiel, he's probably in all of this situation he's been put in. But as he sees the open valley and all of these dry bones, I'm sure he had questions like, where did these bones come from? Whose bones were these? Why are they in this valley? But throughout all these questions, God begins to question him, saying, can these bones live? Now Ezekiel, he has no idea. He just begins to say, you know, God, you know. You know everything. You know if these bones can live. But I believe God was not looking for that answer. Because God then says to him a commandment. And God tells Ezekiel, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. 
Now, Ezekiel is probably confused by this statement because how could bones, dead, dry bones, hear the prophecy of God? How can something that is dead hear what God is trying to say to it? And you got to notice, God, when he says to prophesy to the bones, he says, oh, ye dry bones. God even understands that they've been there a long time. He understands that the situation seems hopeless. It seems lost. It seems dead. But God did not want these bones to stay dry and to stay dead. The God, he says to say unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live. God realized that the bones don't have ears to hear. But the thing is, when God begins to speak, dead things begin to come back to life. When God begins to speak, your life begins to be put back together. The things that have been separated begin to be put together in God. The things that have bound you together in God and the things that have brought you closer to him will be renewed in God's word. God, he commands for Ezekiel to prophesy to these dead bones and speak to them that they may be put back together and that they may live again. But notice that that wasn't the end of God's command. But he says, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. He didn't want these people just to be put back together for no reason. But he wants them to be put back together so that he could be glorified and that they would know that he is God and he is the creator of everything. You see, when you are in a dead situation and God begins to speak to your situation, it's not just to put you back together so you can walk away from him. He doesn't just put you back together so that you can do whatever you want. Because that's just going to lead you right back to death. But God wants you to live tonight. So when he prophesies over you to be put back together and to live again, he says that you shall know that I am the Lord. Because there is no other way you would be back in this place. You see, some of you in this room, you know what it's like to be back in the world. You know what it's like to be in sin and be dead in the ways of this world and in the ways of sin. You understand what it's like to be separated from God and for all the pieces of your life to be broken. But you also know that God began to put your life back together when you came back to his house and you began to hear his word. And God, he began to put you together, bring the pieces that were broken and mend them into something greater. And you know that there's no way you'd be back in this place by your own will. But it is by the will and the grace of God you are in this place tonight. It is by the grace and mercy of God that you are here worshiping him and praising him and that your life is back in order because God commanded it to be so. So Ezekiel, he begins to listen to this commandment. And it says in the scripture, starting with verse 7, So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, 
and the bones came together, bone to his bone. Yes, yes, yes. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Sometimes your life may be put back together. Things may be lined up again and things are back in order. Yet there's something still lacking. There's something still missing. You need the breath of God. You need something more. You see, God used the prophet to speak over the dry bones. He used the prophet to speak, and through that prophet, things began to happen. You got to understand, when God uses a preacher, when he uses a teacher, he's using them to prophesy over your life so that your pieces can be put back together. That's why the Bible says you cannot be saved without a preacher. It's by the foolishness of preaching. You need a preacher in your life. You need a pastor in your life to guide you. It's the word of God. Because without a pastor, your pieces may not begin to come back together. You may just come in this place, a broken vessel. You may just come in this place and feel broken, but you'll leave the same way that you came. If you want the pieces of your life to be put back together and for God to do something in your life, you need a preacher to speak truth into you, who speaks truth into your life and prophesies over you so that you can be changed. So Ezekiel, he prophesied and things began to happen. There was a shaking. You see, sometimes God's going to shake some things in your life so that you can be put back together. It may seem like God's just breaking things apart, but that's not what he's doing. He's shaking things up. He's trying to get it to where it'll all line up again. Just because your life feels shaken doesn't mean God's not in control. Just because things seem like they're in a mess doesn't mean God's still in control. Come on, God's still in control in this place tonight. We serve a God who's got the world in his hands. There's nothing too hard for him. So when you see your mess or you see your struggle or your trial, just remember that God may just be shaking you so that in the end you can be better and put back together to live for him. But again, Ezekiel spoke. Everything was put back together, but the breath was missing. So then God, he speaks to him again and says, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. You see, God's going to prophesy not only to you, not only to your dead situation, but he's going to begin to prophesy to your surrounding. Because if the wind does not come, the life will not begin again. He begins to speak to your surrounding and says, wind from all the four corners of the earth, wind come in. We must remember tonight that the wind signifies the spirit of God. So God, when he puts you back together and he puts you back in place and gets you back in the house of God, he doesn't leave you without the spirit. When you come back to this altar, like Pastor was talking about Sunday, and you begin to build an altar to him and sacrifice your life before him and sanctify your life before him, God's going to come down and say, I'm not going to leave you breathless. Right, right. Come on. 
Whereas the New Testament says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but I will come unto you. My spirit will come inside of you and guide you every single day of your life. It's by the Holy Ghost that we live in him. It's by the spirit of God that we can live today. So Ezekiel, he spoke and prophesied to the winds. And the breath came into this people. And they lived once more. And as they stood upon their feet, they were an exceeding great army. You see, Ezekiel didn't know what these people were until they had life again. At the beginning, they were just dry, dead bones. But after God began to work, and after God put everything back together, and he put his spirit in his people, they became an exceeding great army. We aren't just given the spirit of God to lay low, do what we want, just live life in the flow. No, but God has created us and he's put us together in this place tonight to be an exceeding great army. He gave us his spirit so that we can march upon the devil's playground and say, devil, you don't have any authority any longer. We're taking back what is ours. So in the dark county, this may seem like the devil's playground, but God's put a church, a spirit-filled church in Solid Rock, Apostolic Church, to be an exceeding great army. And as that exceeding great army, we're going to march on the devil's territory. And we're going to take back what the devil stole. We're going to take back our lost loved ones. We're going to take back the drug addicts and bring them to the house of God. Not only that, but we're going to begin to go into the prisons, go on the highways and the byways and reach those that are lost. We are an exceeding great army in this place tonight. We're an exceeding great army. Like the song says, there's an army rising up. He's created an army of spirit-filled believers. God, after Ezekiel has seen all of this occur, he begins to explain this vision to him. And then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, They say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore, prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. (laughs) Here's where it gets good. And shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. He's given us his spirit. He's given us life and life more abundantly. He's opened up our graves. He's opened up our dead places. And he's brought us out. He's brought us out of the darkness and into his marvelous light today. He grabbed us out of the miry clay and set us on a rock to stay. Come on, somebody. Aren't you thankful for God's spirit tonight? Aren't you thankful for a God who put your pieces back together, who said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but I'm going to comfort you with my spirit? We serve a great God tonight. Romans chapter 8. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Sin just leads you to death. That thing you keep committing, the pornography you keep looking at, the person you keep sleeping with, it's just going to leave you to death. Those drugs you keep doing, the distractions you keep putting before God, they're just going to leave you to death. But it says here, That when we have the Spirit of God, we won't walk. We won't walk after the lust of the flesh. We won't walk after the dead. But we will have life in Jesus. And we will turn away from our wicked ways and turn to the one who saved us. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is flesh, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When you begin to feel in your life that there's no peace. And it's constant chaos in your life. Have you examined your heart? What are you walking after? Where is your mind at? Are you carnally minded? Thinking of whatever you want to do? Doing the things the flesh desires? Or are you spiritually minded? Thinking after what God is wanting you to do. Thinking after doing the things that are in his word. Because that's where you find life and peace. It's when you have your mind set on the spirit, focused on God and his word. The chapter continues because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed Can it be? It's enmity with God. It's completely different than the nature of God. We cannot have a carnal mind in this place. We've got to turn away from our wicked ways. The carnal things are not subject to God. They just do what they want. We can't do that in this place tonight. We got to follow everything that God is telling us to do. We got to follow what his word says to do. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You're dead without the Spirit of God. You're not one of his children when you you have the Spirit of God in you. We need the Spirit of God. We need the Holy Ghost today. And I pray that if you do not have the Holy Ghost in this place, that God would just get a hold of you and bring you to an altar where he could fill you with the Holy Ghost. 
You need the Holy Ghost. It's Bible. You see, Lazarus, they thought he was long gone. He's been dead for four days. Jesus has not been here to raise him up. He didn't heal him of the sickness. It's over. He's dead. He's gone. It's over. But Jesus had other plans. In fact, when he saw the disbelief of everybody around him and the hurt and the pain, he began to weep. He began to ask, do you believe that I am the son of God? Do you believe that I can do this? Of course, they said, yes, yes, you can, but it's too late. You should have did it four days earlier when he was still alive. He's already been in the grave. He's stinking at this point. But Jesus told them, roll away the stone from that grave. Because I have a different plan. And God, he understood That if he can just get them to move what was blocking them from their miracle. If he can just get these people to move away the stumbling block. Move away the strongholds that are keeping them from him. And keeping them from their miracle. Keeping them from their promise. So they rolled away the stone from the grave. And Jesus, he calls out, Lazarus! Come forth. You see, God's not, he's not just quietly calling for you tonight. He's crying out your name. Come forth. Don't live in the dead situation any longer. Come out of your grave. You don't have to be bound by the grave. You don't have to be bound by your sin. You may feel like you're in a dead situation, but I'm not done with you yet. And so he cries out for Lazarus. And out comes walking a man wrapped in grave clothes. Lazarus was alive, and he was walking out of his grave. But again, he still had his grave clothes on. You see, just because you've walked out of your dead situation and you're starting to walk to Jesus, you got to understand there's some things you got to let go. There's some sins you got to let go. There's some friends you got to let go. There's some habits you got to let go. There's some albums you have to let go. There's some movies, there's some TV shows. No, I understand. We live in a Netflix and chill generation, and I get that. But if we're too focused on what show we're binge-watching at this time and not focused on the Word of God and not focused on prayer, then what's the point? It's just going to last for a season. You got to get rid of some things tonight. At this altar, you got to get rid of some things that are holding you bound. Things that identify you with your sins. Things that identify you with your past. You got to let go of it. Because the grave clothes, they helped Lazarus identify with a dead person. But tonight, I don't want to identify with the dead. But I want to identify with the living. I want to identify with the spirit-filled people tonight. So Lazarus, he now takes off his grave clothes because Jesus tells him to take it off. Tells him to let all of that go. And the amazing thing about Lazarus is he wasn't done after God performed his miracle. But until Jesus died on the cross, Lazarus followed after him every step of the way. He would not leave his side. You see, God may have done your miracle already. Your promise may have come to pass at this point. 
But you can't stop living for God after that. You can't just fall back into your grave after God's fulfilled what he said he would do. Just because the promise has come to pass doesn't mean the commandment is not still in place. Because promise and commandment will always go hand in hand. In every covenant relationship with God, there's promise that God gives. And then there's commandment that he asks of. With Abraham, God promised that he would be a father of many nations. God promised his seed would be as the sand in the sea and the stars in the sky. God promised the land of Canaan. But there was a commandment to go with that. Every male of the age of eight years old needed to be circumcised. That was the commandment. So every covenant has a promise and a commandment. So Jesus, he calls out to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. And you may not, he may not have said it, but the promise was Lazarus, you get to live again. But the commandment was come forth. That wasn't just a one-time deal. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Come to me. Follow me. If you go through me, you'll find eternal life. We need more Lazaruses in this place. We need more people who are not just going to be done when God delivers them of their addictions. A people that are just going to be done after God gives them what they needed and blesses them. We need a people that are going to continue walking with God step and step. We're going to follow his word every single day of their lives. We need a people who said, God, I once was dead in sin, but you raised me up. And I'm so grateful for the miracle that I'm going to walk with you. Thank you, Jesus. you may have been dead, and God raised you up, but you're not done yet. You may have repented. You may have been baptized in Jesus' name. You may have been filled with his spirit, but there's living to do. There's a walk. There's a daily walk with God. Because if we forget that, then what good was our repentance? What good is repentance if we're just going to turn back to the sin we're asking forgiveness of? Because that's not repentance. That's just sorrow. Repentance is when you say, I know I did wrong. But God, I'm going to turn away from that wrongdoing. And I'm going to walk toward you and follow after you tonight. And every single day. God's searching for a people who said, I may have been dead, but I'm not done. Because remember, God said, you may be dead, but I'm not done with you. You may be dry bones, but I've made you a great army. He said, you're dead, but not done. But now we got to transition in our minds. And say, God, I was dead, but I'm still not done. I may be alive again, but I know there's so much more. You've got so much more for me. You've got a calling on my life. You've got a promise set before me. You've delivered me from where I was. But God, I want to follow you still. Because there's a next level for me. You've brought me in on the entry level. You've raised me back up, but now i got to start over. you got to start over tonight. Start back at repentance. Kill off that sin. Kill off that sin that does so easily beset you. 
and say, God, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to kill my flesh. I'm going to crucify my flesh. Because I'm not done. You have more for me. You have more for me, Jesus. We got to get desperate tonight. We got to get desperate for a move of God. We sang about we need a move. But do you want to move? We sing, you don't come if we don't move. If you won't come, we won't move. What happens when God says, I want you to do the moving? Because the Bible says, if you draw nigh unto me, I will draw nigh unto you. Right. God's not going to get close to you if you're not willing to get close to him. He's a perfect gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. So every single day of your life, you got to choose Jesus. Right. It's not just, it oh, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. you got to choose him every day of your life. Not just a one-time deal, and then you're saved. There's living to do. There's scripture to follow. Because last time I checked, the Bible says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But they didn't stop there. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in breaking of bread and in fellowship and in prayer. They didn't stop at a Pentecostal experience. But they said, God, I want more of you. I want more of your word, more of your presence in my life. I want to communicate you with you every single day. And I want to fellowship with your people so that we can become that great army. But we've got to kill off our flesh. Say, we're done with that. We're done with the sin. And turn to him and say, God, I'm dead. But I know I'm not done. I know you have more for me. You see, Jesus, he was dead for three days. He said it was finished on the cross. But that was just with shedding his blood. He shed his blood so that we could be saved. But he didn't stop there. He said, I'm dead, but I'm going to do some more. I'm going to go down to hell and take back the keys, the death, hell, and the grave. And I'm going to rise up on the third day in power and in glory to prove to you that I am the I am. That I am your Savior. That I am the one who is. It is to come. He said, I'm going to prove to you that I am who I say I am. That I am the one true living God. That I am the great I am. That I am Jehovah Jireh. That I am Jehovah Nisi. That I am the I am. He wants to prove to you tonight that when he raises you up from your dead situation, that he took the keys so you don't have to. He said, now you can just kill your flesh and start over. I became the ultimate sacrifice. So even when you feel dead, you're not done. Somebody's got to get a hold of this tonight. You may feel like you're in a dead situation. You may feel like all hope is lost. But God's knocking at your door tonight. And he's saying, you may be dead. But you're not done. It's not over for you. You may feel like you're so far from God. But he says, I'm just as close as the mention of my name. We've got to live in him tonight. 
and say, I'm not dead any longer. But I want to live for you. I'm not done in this. But I want to live for you. Again, we need the Spirit of God. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. You don't have to be dead anymore. Because that same Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead. It can dwell in you tonight. That same spirit will quicken your mortal body. He doesn't want you to be dead anymore. But he wants you to live forever in him. Because it's through him we have eternal life. You may feel like you're dead. But there's so much life ahead of you. There's so much more for you tonight. And as we'd all stand in this place. Who am I speaking to tonight? You may feel dead. But you're not done. God's not done with you. He's not finished with you. He wants to fill you with his spirit. He wants to lead you every day and he wants you to walk with him. But we have to understand that we need to leave the death behind us. Kill off the sin and leave it behind us. To live in him so that he can do and finish what he started. He wants to finish what he started on Calvary. He wants to finish what he started on the day of Pentecost. He's going to finish it by coming back for his people. You see, the day is coming when the trumpet's going to blow and God's going to cry out, my people, come forth. And the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And us that are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet them in the air. But are you going to be ready for that? But are you going to be dead outside of that? Who am I speaking to tonight? You may feel dead. But God doesn't want you to be left in death. He wants you to live in Him. He wants you to live in Him. He wants you to kill off the flesh and live in Him. If every head is bowed and every eye is closed in this place, I don't know who I'm speaking to, but if you feel like you're in a dead situation, that you're in a hopeless situation and that you don't know where to turn. Why don't you come to this altar tonight and find a God who wants to raise you up from your dead situation, to raise you up out of the miry clay. Why don't you find that kind of savior tonight who doesn't want to leave you in the dumps who wants to pull you out. You may feel like sin has left you in a dead place. That you have a dead spiritual walk with God. That your prayer life is dead. That your promise is dead. But God wants to resurrect that tonight. He wants to resurrect your life. Resurrect your prayer life. Resurrect this walk with God. Why don't you come to this altar tonight and revive 
what was once dead and prophesy over your prayer life and say it's going to live again prophesy over your promise and say it's going to live again because I know a guy who has a spirit that he wants to put inside of me to give me life won't you come to this altar tonight